the Lax Factor Podcast. What is up, College Lacrosse fans? You're watching episode 137 of the Lax Factor Lacrosse Podcast, and today we are going to talk about all of the games from Saturday and as many as we can from Sunday. Just got done having my heart broken by Army and Syracuse. Army put the big hurt on Syracuse uh, by a score of 18-11. So we'll talk about that one first, but we're also going to talk about Virginia Loyola, Penn State Rutgers played a great game, Ohio State Hopkins, Michigan Maryland, Denver Marquette, Bryant and Stony Brook. And then we've got a couple of games that are going on right now as I'm recording here that we'll get you updates for. Before I get into it, as always, be sure to like, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and you can always go to laxfactor.com, get swag. We got shirts, hats, all sorts. I think this is a Nike hat that I'm wearing right now, so that doesn't matter. But let's get into it. The Syracuse Army game. Syracuse came out hot, and I I couldn't have been more excited. I was pumped. Story of the first quarter was their midfield. Dordovic, he went off for a hat trick in the first quarter. Buttermore got got some as well. Scanlon scored the first goal of the game uh, while being short-sticked. And then Dordovic, he was just dodging poles. He took Hudgens to the rack twice off their first two possessions, scored a goal on one of them, or off his first two touches against um, Hudgens anyway, and scored on one of them and, and got a good shot off on another on the first time. So Army had no answer, and it looked like legitimately like Syracuse might roll. Now, I did not think at all that Syracuse was going to roll. I was terrified from the get-go that they came out so hot. And then when, once Army got it kind of back 6-4, I was like, oh, no, this is going to be scary now. So second quarter, Army settles in. They start to – I've been drinking here all day, so I'm going to I'm gonna be a little full as I'm talking here. Uh, second quarter, Army settles in. They dominated possessions. They turned that into four straight goals, getting the game back to within 6-5. There was a turning point in the second quarter where I thought, this is it. This, this moment in the second quarter could be the ball game where Syracuse, they get a man up, and um, Dordovic ends up stinging one from top center for his fourth goal of the game. Army could have gotten a stop. That would have been huge at the time I was thinking it that way. And then later on in the second quarter, though, as Syracuse scores that goal, that gives them a two-goal lead. I'm thinking that's the swing we needed, the momentum back. Army scores again to get back within one. They score again in that second quarter to tie it up. And then they score again with like 14 seconds left or some crap like that. Let's see here. Uh, 14 seconds left in the first half off a streaking cutter wide open down the middle of the defense. It was Aiden Burns who stuck that for Army to give Army the lead at halftime. Now, I could go into the second half and what happened, but the, the reality was Syracuse owned the first quarter and looked every bit like one of the top five teams in the country. Over the course of quarters two through four, Syracuse barely looked like a ranked team. And that's the truth. I mean, I like... I am a Cuse homer. I'm going to be uh, uh, ride the highs of when they do well like no other, but I'll also be stupid realistic when they play poorly. And the reality was the Syracuse attack, number one, the Syracuse attack was awful. Scanlon, you can make the argument, well, hey, Scanlon was one, uh, one and two and Rafis was two and one, but they did nothing in terms of generating and creating offense. Scanlon, he put up some points, but at one point when Cuse was down 16 to 11, he had nine shots, six of those shots on cage, and only one goal. That is not good enough because the reality was the Syracuse attack, including Cook, uh, even Buttermore did it, Rafis did it, Scanlon did it numerous times. They put the ball right in Schupler's stick. And I mean, granted, Schupler is a hell of a goalie. He didn't play his best game, though. Syracuse shot the ball poorly. Their attack did not generate anything. Everything had to come from the midfield. And then once Army kind of settled down and started playing good defense on that Syracuse midfield, which Army did, and then Schupler started seeing the ball better, it was over because the Syracuse attack could do nothing. Normally, I don't like to point people out. But this is a very obvious thing, and it's kind of – I've been kind of thinking this in the back of my head, and I think a lot of Q's fans have, but Cook. Cook, his production is zero. He did nothing. He was a total non-factor in every way. You cannot have attackmen, even if it's your third attackman, be a total non-factor in the game. The only thing he really does is he rides, but he didn't do that exceptionally well in this game. His army cleared the ball really well. Uh, he had two shots, one ground ball, one caused turnover, and one turnover. So that flip-flopped and evened out. If he's creating turnovers in the ride, then it's like, hey, giddy up. But you know, Hiltz with Hiltz on the roster and Hiltz gets in and gets a goal, an easy goal and a man up. I think you have to give Hiltz to start in the next game. It cooks now had about seven games 
uh, to, to start on attack, I think five last year, and then one. So six games to start on attack, and his point production as a third attackman just isn't there. Rafis already isn't a Dodger anymore. Rafis pretty much plays off ball, tries to feed, plays really well in transition, but he's not a Dodger. Cook is not a Dodger. Scanlon is not a Dodger. You cannot have a, a three attackmen that are all non-Dodgers and that, you know, Scanlon is deadly and he's going to do well, but he needs some help and he needs one of his fellow attackmen to be able to go to the rack and none of them can. Porter looked out of sorts, um, but I think a lot of that was a defense. The defense put Porter in a lot of really bad situations. He wasn't seeing the ball well, but you're not going to when your defense isn't playing great in front of you. They played decent early. Porter made a couple of saves, but then didn't do a whole lot after. So he looked rough, but he'll be okay. I think he'll be okay, and I think the, the Syracuse defense will be okay. Where I was really disappointed and let down was the Syracuse offense overall just because that attack group has to be better. I expected them to be able to win a shootout, and they did not win a shootout. They did not take care of the ball. Granted, first game, I'm not that, hey, let's throw in the towel, the season's over kind of guy, but they legitimately did not I mean, I wouldn't be the least bit surprised nor upset if they fell out of the top 10. They did not look like a, a top 10 team. You, you, you know, Army last year against Vir- or, or last week against Virginia, they aren't, you know, they were uh, on the edge of 10 and they lose to the number three team in the country or whatnot. That's to be expected. Syracuse should have won this ball game and Army came out and made them look ridiculous. Um, as we go through stats for Army, uh, Schupler, he played huge down the stretch. He didn't start hot, and I thought that was a good sign for Cuse early, but Schupler played great down the stretch. He ended up with 12 saves versus 11 goals against. He wins the goalie battle, and Army wins the game. Nick Turn played incredible. Four goals, three assists out of Brendan Nick Turn, number 20 for Army. Great attackman. He was the best player on the field today. Uh, you can make the argument that Dordovic was, but Dordovic's team lost badly, so I give it to Nick Turn in this one. Abshire, 4-2. and two. Edinger, 3-1. and one. Phillip and Burns, both three goals. So the question around Army's guys was, hey, someone, other guys need to step up and play around Nick Turn. And so far, Army's, you know, has guys doing that. Abshire, Edinger, uh, Phillip and Burns all look good, all look like great supporting players to Nick Turn. So he's going to get the help. Syracuse stats, Dordovic was great. Four goals and a helper. Scanlon, one and two. That that He did not have a good game, though. One and two, nine shots, six on cage, and only one goal. That's Three of those may have well as been have been turnovers just about. That's how bad that was. Rafis two and one. Tromboli and Curly one Curry one goal each. Fop was eighteen to twenty nine from the dot. Dominated early. Did not dominate down the stretch. So Army started playing a lot better at the faceoff dot down the stretch. That hurt him. Porter thirteen saves versus eighteen goals against. And like I said, I, I, he was not seeing the ball. Great, but I don't put a lot of all of that on him. I think the defense did not have their best outing as well. In the end. Syracuse is going to be okay. I mean, they're, if they continue to play like this, they're going to be the worst team in the ACC. But we've got to, in this weird COVID season, we've kind of got to allow for teams to grow and for teams to get their shit together. And, uh, you know, this is that game. Army lost their first game against Virginia. Didn't look great at times. Battled back and made it okay. Syracuse did not look good at all in their first outing outside of that first quarter. So rough game. They got R- Virginia next week. They're going to have to rebound. And then that's the beauty of Syracuse's schedule. You drop one against Army that you didn't want to drop, it happens. You come back and you beat Virginia next week, giddy up. Now, beating Virginia, though, that's another whole thing, and we'll talk about that later in the week. Now let's talk about Virginia at Loyola. 15-12, the Cavs win that game. Loyola, they jumped out early uh, to an early lead in the first quarter, and things were looking good for them. Then UVA ripped through the second quarter like the animals that they are, even uh, things up and later taking the lead. Once they got the lead, Loyola was able to kind of give them a three-goal buffer, come back and get within two or one, and then it just kind of went back and forth like that. Virginia pretty much held on and controlled the game from, you know, once they got the lead back there over the course of the second quarter, but, you know, Loyola never went away, and Loyola kept kind of chipping and chirping them. Matt Moore, he bullied his way to five goals off 14 shots, and is there anybody better than Matt Moore at getting to the middle of the field? I have all these clips that I'm going to try to put together something just showing Matt Moore getting to the middle of the field, getting to the middle of the field. And it doesn't matter if you're on him in good position. If he can get himself to the middle of the field, he finds ways to get shots off. So Matt Moore, incredible ball player, and Virginia's glad to have him back and healthy. Connor Schellenberger, two goals, three helpers. Peyton Cormier, a pedestrian, three goals for him. Pedestrian for him, I mean. Bertrand, two goals. Petey LaSala, baby, a goal, 15-24 against Bailey Savio. So that was key for UVA was that LaSala won the faceoff battle and he put up a point for Loyola. 
stats, Kevin Lindley, four goals, Olmstead one and two, Evan James, three and one, Bailey Savio was 14 to 31, lost the battle to LaSala, who also scored a goal in addition to winning that matchup. So LaSala wins that. Cam Wires and Kyle LeBlanc, even with Loyola losing this game, they did a really good job defensively, I thought, against Virginia and played well in keeping Virginia to even 15 goals. Cam Wires and LeBlanc are part of the reason why, combined for four cause turnovers, seven GBs for Loyola, and I think overall that Loyola defense did play well despite that loss. In the goalie battle, neither goalie had a huge day. Schaefer, 10 saves uh, of versus 15 goals against, and then Gavin for UVA, nine saves versus 12 goals. Schaefer looked better in their opening game, but he didn't look bad. Both goalies are going to be serviceable. It was just a, an offensive game here in the end. So Hughes and UVA, they're going to face off next week. So everybody's going to want to watch that and, you know, huge game because UVA, they're sitting at what, 3-0? and Hughes at 0-1. You sit here like with talking about Denver. It already feels like a must win and Hughes dropping that game to Army with six games that they have to play against the ACC in a 12-game schedule. Cannot afford to lose too many games they're going to they're going to need not need but they're going to really want to get that game against UVA maybe in hindsight nobody ever wants to lose anybody who sits here and says oh that coach is cool with that loss no desco is pissed right now he is not happy with that loss but uh, losses will teach you something and maybe Q's can pull something from this and then use that next week against virginia penn state and Rutgers. and this was the game we were talking about where penn state what they wanted to do was prove hey we can hang even without grant amen and uh, Rutgers said, hey, we pick up a new guy here. We got ourselves a Connor Kirst uh, who played midfield at Villanova, and he looked like he was playing attack for Rutgers as I was watching that game. I'm almost positive he was playing attack as I was watching that game. And uh, Rutgers beats Penn State 11-9, surprisingly. And I, I say surprisingly, even when in my preview, I said, hey, I think Penn State's going to win this game, but I wouldn't be the least bit surprised to see Rutgers win it. And they did. First time Penn State's only scored nine goals since losing to Robert Morris 12-9 in 2018. And that's if I look correctly, but I think that's the, that's the lowest goal scoring output since 2018 and the loss to Robert Morris for Penn State. Uh, they came out hot 2-0 lead, but once Rutgers tied things up at 4-4, they looked better at like the better team through the end. Rutgers got a couple of early possessions where, uh, Kines came up big, but, uh, you know, overall Rutgers looked great. And then, uh, they kind of just kept enduring and just kept rolling and Penn state just didn't have any answers. Uh, Penn State stats, TJ Malone, three goals, two helpers, Dan Rame, I don't know how to pronounce that even, three and one, Dylan Folds, two and two, Mac O'Keefe was quiet, one goal, barely heard his name called throughout the telecast, actually, it was pretty, pretty odd, and he just, Penn State just did not look great offensively throughout that game. Kobe Kines, he made a few good saves early, did not play well through the rest of the game. Eight saves versus 11 goals against in the loss. And then Gerard Arceri, 5 of 10 from the from the dot. Uh, Jake Glatt, 7 of 13 from the dot. So they won the bulk of the draws between the two of them, but it didn't matter. Rutgers was good enough on offense that they win the game. Connor Kirst played attack for Rutgers. Three goals, four assists in his debut for the Scarlet, Scarlet Knights. Is that what the Rutgers are? Is that what the Rutgers are? Is that what Rutgers is? Is the Scarlet Knights. Adam Charlambides, three goals and a helper. Shane Knobloch, two goals. He looked good. Knobloch's just a freshman. Looked good early in the game. Didn't shoot the rock great overall, but he puts up those two goals. So that's he's a player to watch for Rutgers, not just this year, but in, in the future as well. Colin Kirst got the start in cage, which I did not expect, and he played incredible. 15 saves versus nine goals against. One might say he was the difference in that game where you're sitting here trying to figure out where, which way are the, the scale's going to tip. Connor or Colin Kirst, I didn't think he was going to play. He did. It was like one of his only like his second or third career start. Played great. And then Jonathan Dugenio, 11-23 from the faceoff dot. Not great, but still, they got the W. It was good enough against Gerard Arceri and company for Rutgers to get the win. We have uh, Ohio State and Johns Hopkins. 14-8, to eight, Ohio State put it on hop. And uh, one of the interesting things to watch in this game was Joey Epstein. I was hoping that Joey Epstein came out and played great. He didn't. You know, I picked this game wrong. I was hoping Hopkins would overachieve. Hopkins did the opposite. Ohio State played without Inacio at the faceoff dot, which I thought would factor more than it did. It didn't. 
Uh, in the end, Matt Narowski, 14 to 21 for Hopkins. Ryan Tarafenko and Sam Faber, who took the faceoff draws for Ohio State, did admirably without Inacio. Nine of 17 between the two of them, and then the two other guys didn't fare well. So that was odd. And right off the bat, I thought that was advantage. Hopkins didn't turn out that way. Griffin Hughes, 3-1 and one for Ohio State. Trey LeClaire, four goals, bullied his way around the field. Uh, he's going to be tough to stop. 130-plus 100, goal scorer on his career. So he's just going to keep rolling. Jack Myers, three goals. Jackson Reed was quiet. He just had a dish. Ohio State looked sharp, though, overall, despite the fact it was their first game, playing against another team who uh, it was their first game as well. Um, partly because they weren't cute. They, they didn't try to do too much. They just dodged hard to the cage. Hopkins played a lot of Ole defense, didn't play really good help defense. And they're like the first three, four, five goals for Ohio State was just dudes cut into the middle of the field with the ball, scoring goals uncontested. It was pretty crazy. They jump out to a three-goal lead off three shots before Hopkins even got a chance to catch their breath. Uh, Skyler Walland, 11 saves versus eight goals against for Ohio State in cage. He looked good. Jeff Henrik. Two cause turnovers, four GBs, a six strip that I do have a cut for that at some point I'll put up uh, on social media um, over Joey Epstein. He just took his candy and then took off upfield. And then Omari DeBerry, he caused two turnovers at short stick D mid. He actually looked good. A young kid, uh, short stick D mid for Ohio State. I think he had a goal as well, sniped one in transition at one point. Hopkins, Connor DeSimone did get the started attack as inside lacrosse had reported. He had three and one. Epstein was just one goal. He didn't really factor all that much. And then where was everybody else for Hopkins? I mean, Baskin, one goal. Williams, one goal. Zinn, one assist. Hopkins did not look good offensively. Josh Kersan, he struggled early, settled in though, and I think he still played better overall than Hopkins has gotten out of other goalies. I think he was a bright spot despite the loss for Hopkins. 13 saves versus 14 goals. He gave up three goals off the first three shots, but then played, I think, well through the rest of the game. So Hopkins, they're going to have to improve, but they got a late start. Uh, they, I think out of all the teams that played to, uh, yesterday and today, they got the latest start of all of them, so they may be better. Michigan, Maryland, not a whole lot to talk about in this one. Michigan got waxed by Maryland. Uh, it was all Maryland as expected. Big key here, Jared Bernhardt, he did not look at all hobbled by the time off and by not getting a fall because he was trying to play football. Stats for Maryland, Maltz was four, uh, Mar M Daniel Maltz, five goals. Anthony DeMeo, two and three. Logan Wisnowskis, three and one. Bernhardt, two and two. Kyle Long, two and one. So right down the roster, all the usual suspects factored for Maryland. Logan McEnany in cage, six saves versus nine goals against. I forgive him for that, though. When you're beating up on teams, you tend to let up more than you end up saving. It's just part of the game. Uh, Justin Shockey, split draws, 50-50, 14-28, not bad. Nick Grill, four GBs, three cause turnovers on defense for Maryland. So that was solid. Michigan, tough outing, but Josh Zuwada, four goals and a helper. He looked good and was a bright spot. Uh, factored, uh, sh he shot the rock well, carried the ball well, four goals off eight shots. So that's a, a good outing from Zuwada, and you're going to see a lot of those this year as he plays. Michael Boehm. Uh, two goals and an assist. Zawada needs help, though. Zawada is going to need help for Michigan. You can't, even though they're playing Maryland, granted, guys have to do more. And, I mean, when Zawada's putting up the bulk of your points here and is factoring that much, other guys are going to have to do something or it is going to be a long season for Michigan playing the Big Ten schedule there. Denver and Marquette. Denver at Marquette, actually. And Marquette looked good. There's a couple of guys from Marquette that I like. Denver kind of controlled the game, though. It wasn't as close as the score indicated as Marquette kind of chirped back late, scoring their ninth goal with just two seconds left on the clock. So even though it was a one-goal game, it wasn't really a one-goal game. And by the time they scored that last goal, there was no shot of them doing anything. Denver just scrapped on the faceoff, two seconds run off the clock, game over. Alex Simmons looked really good. This was his best game of the year. Four goals and three helpers. Three of them. Over the first quarter, two of them like carbon copy, copies of each other from the same wing. So he looked good. And, and then eventually Marquette was like, hey, we can't let Simmons shoot from there on the wing like that because he's just going to keep scoring goals. Jackson Morrill, two and one. Ethan Walker, three assists. So he kind of flipped his output into the helpers mostly. Riley Curtis, one and two. Alex Stathakis. 13 to 22 from the faceoff dot. He looked good, and Thompson did not look bad in cage for Denver. Nine saves versus nine goals. Marquette, the guy I liked was uh, Griffin Fleming. 
Really good looking ball player. Three goals and a helper for Marquette. Anthony Orsini, one and one. Devin Cohen, two goals. Both Marquette keepers that played, they both fared well. Richard had eight saves. Hulsman had Hulsman. Yep. Hulsman had seven saves, and the both of them above 50% on the day. So that helped Marquette stay a little bit closer in this game than they otherwise would have, which was good for them. Another good game, and actually I'd picked this one correctly, one of the few probably that I picked correctly all, all weekend here. Stony Brook 8, Bryant, uh, no, Stony Brook 14, Bryant 8. And Bryant jumped out to an early four-goal lead, and then Stony Brook tied it up four. Then Bryant went up 6-4, then 7-5. Then Stony Brook got their stuff together, tie it up 7-7 with just 30 seconds left in the first half. And then Stony Brook took the lead, scoring the first goal of the second half and then never trailed again en route to their win. Uh, Battle of the Goalies was won by Stony Brook keeper, Anthony Palma, 16 saves versus eight goals against, and Luke Carasioli for Bryant, nine saves versus 14 goals against. Once one goalie, Stony Brook goalie specifically, he had a really good game. The other goalie struggled, and you lose that battle, your team often loses the game. Stony Brook, uh, stats, Corey Van Jehoven, three goals and a helper, Matt Anderson, two and one, Wayne White, one and two, Mike Cannell, or maybe it was O'Cannell, I'm not sure if I just had two C's in there by accident. Uh, he was good for three goals. Three guys had two points and a couple had one, so they spread it out all the way down their roster. Tom Guggen, Dugan, Tom Dugan, amid, he had four ground balls, one cause turnover. And then for Bryant, Bennett and Ab, uh, Abladian, and oh wait, Bennett, Abladian, and McGovern all had two goals, I think. I, I might have screwed that up. And then their faceoff guy, Liber, Liber, Liberty. Whatever the hell their faceoff guy's name is, he ends up uh, 18 of 26. So he won at the faceoff dot. It didn't matter, though. So, uh, Stony Brook was just too good in the end as they take it to Bryant. Now, as I'm talking right now, we have games that are still going on here. I still, every time I load the score and I see that Syracuse score, it makes me sad. Georgetown Villanova, right now in the fourth quarter, George, Georgetown is putting it on Villanova badly, 13 to 1. So, I mean, if there was any question about how good is Georgetown's defense really, 13 to 1 against Villanova, I'm not going to go down and look and make you guys all listen to me breathe heavy into the mic, but I bet you nobody is going to have an output that low for the rest of the season. So, that's a good job. Third quarter, Robert Morris is leading Colgate 12 to 7. Providence is beating St. John's 15 to 7. And then North Carolina, as I speak right now, is beating Richmond 5 to 3. So that is what's going on now. And then as we go through the other games that I may not have talked about, Sacred Heart, Hofstra ended up beating Sacred Heart 13 to 6. And what was the story of that game here? Let me see. Oh, wait, let's go to the Air Force Utah. Air Force Utah, I watched that game. Heck of a game going back and forth. Utah looked great. I actually thought Utah was going to pull this out, and Air Force ends up winning it in overtime over Utah. Now, the dude here that I like is this Tyler Bradbury. I like him for Utah. This Brandon Wilson, he was 2-2. Two and two. Bradbury was 1-3 and three in the game. Quincy Peen was 4-0. and oh for Air Force. Matthew O'Rourke was one and two. Brendan Krauss. You know who hasn't really factored for Air Force is the Dodd kid that everybody thought was going to factor, uh, factor heavily. The Including myself. Uh, Braden Host has been a very good in cage for Air Force. He ended up putting up nine saves versus nine goals against. And then Zach Johns had another really good outing for Utah again. He's been keeping them in ball games. 14 saves versus 10 goals against. So uh, Zach Johns and cages look very good for Utah. Utah's look good. I said I was going to keep picking them until they gave me reason not to. Boom. Now I'm released of that obligation, and now I can start picking against Utah. Hofstra, Sacred Heart. Hofstra wins this game 13-6. to I was hoping uh, to see Tyranny tear it up again. Very pedestrian, 1-1 one one for Tyranny after putting up, what was it, 11 points last weekend, 8-3 and three last weekend. Alex Kincannon, uh, Hopkins transfer, I believe, was the the big scorer for Hofstra in this one, 5-1. and one. So that was huge for him. And then, you know, Sacred Heart didn't really have many guys factor beyond that. And we got Towson Duke. Towson buried, or Duke buried Towson 19 to 7. Sowers goes 2 and 4. O'Neill 4 and 0. Oh. Caputo 3 and 1. Robertson in his second game back 3 and 0. Oh. Nakai Montgomery 3 and 0. Oh. So Duke did it all across the field to everybody. Now, the. The teams, the, the Syracuse thing, going back to that again, just because I want to talk about that real quick. I think that, that the, you can't have your attack play that poorly. I think that Syracuse, what you're going to see 
is probably them not make any changes. They're going to probably chalk this up to, hey, it's our first game. That's how we're going to roll. And I think that what you're going to have to see out of Cook and maybe some of the other attackmen is just you got to do more. You have to do more. They cannot rely on that first midline. That second midline is really solid, and they can score goals, but they're not the Dodgers and the offensive creators that the first midfield line is. And and I'm just I don't know if Syracuse has an answer. I don't know if they have an attackman on the field that can be the guy to handle his business and to create offense on his own from attack. You might even see a scenario where do they end up having to put Dordovic down at attack? I know this is kind of like oh fire sale. They lost their first game of the year. Let's all freak out. I'm just saying it wasn't just this year and this first game that the Syracuse attack has kind of underachieved. Last year, when things were going well, they would put up some points, but a lot of that was transition points. A lot of that was generated by the midfielders. I think that what we need to see in this Virginia game is those attackmen start earning their spots because I'd like to see Owen Hiltz get some time. I know they did move him in and have him play a little bit of attack here after he scored that man up goal, and I don't know who he replaced, but that's going to be key for Syracuse. They can't they cannot play. They will not be a threat, and they will barely finish a top 10 team having to play six games against an ACC schedule if their attackmen can't get their crap together and start playing aggressive lacrosse and start creating the same way that the midfielders have. That's going to be key. So that is it. I just ripped through these here. It's Saturday afternoon, so I'm not going to go on anymore. I want to get this cut up and out. I got some work early next week. We're going to start doing a new thing where we're going to start putting out film reviews again uh, weekly, a couple a week at least, maybe three a week because they're easy to do. And then we're going to probably continue to either do this this Sunday show either later in the day Sunday so we can catch the Sunday games or we may bump this to Monday. We'll see how it does better. But at least for tonight, this week, you get a Sunday evening show that included at least one of the games. And now we know that Georgetown put it on um, Villanova as they were going through and playing. So as always, thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. As always, go to laxfactor.com uh, to get yourself some swag. This beer filled episode. I don't think I did that bad. I don't think I came off as a guy who had drank a handful of beers during the Syracuse game and then just decided right at the end of the game to do a podcast. I think I rocked it a little bit and that's it. So thank you again. And uh, I'll be back on Wednesday for the preview show and whatever that else we're going to talk about come Wednesday. As always, thank you. And Hoost is out. (laughs) 